Thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here. And what I'd like to do today is give you at least my view of what I think the future of wastewater treatment is going to be in the 21st century. And to do that, I'd like to uh, talk, subdivide my presentation into three areas. One, I'd like to talk about some global trends and their impacts, some uncontrollable events and unintended consequences. And the reason I want to introduce these two subjects is that they impact how we move forward in the future with new designs and or modifications. And then finally, I'd like to talk about future trends, challenges, and opportunities. When we look at the global trends that impact wastewater treatment, population demographics is a very important one, and certainly impact of urban spread and urbanization along coasts. Climate change, we're going to talk a little about uh, sea level rise, but let's take a look at urbanization. Uh, Davis is about up, up here. When this, the, this is the Sacramento Wastewater Treatment Plant. When it was built, there was not a single house around here. And now what's happened is, with all of this development, it precludes a lot of reuse applications that might have been possible. So even though we located these plants far, far away, they have now become in, in, encased with homes. This is the Hyperion plant at Los Angeles. And here what we have is the airport right here. Here's Hyperion. And just to give you an example, uh, computation was done to what if we pump the water from here to, let's say, North Hollywood? That's a distance of about 38 miles and an elevational distance of about 38 feet. It takes more energy than it does to treat it at Hyperion. So a lot of these things weren't planned this way, but this is the way they've worked out. Now, the next issue that we really have to face up to is that it's estimated that 60 to 70 percent of the world's population will live within a coastal region. Now, you cannot continue imagining that we will take water from the interior, bring it to the coast, use it once, and discharge it. It truly is unsustainable. And we're going to talk about some alternatives to that. Impact of sea level rise. In New York City, the original plants were all located where they would drain by gravity because steam pumping was not reliable, near a water body, but in those days, the water bodies weren't channelized. And because of the channelization and the surge effects that we get and the sea level rise, protecting these plants is going to be monumentally expensive. And look at them. They're all up right on the coast up here, all subject to surge flows. And so all of a sudden now, we thought they were perfectly located. But all of a sudden, to think about moving these plants, there's no place to put them. So what, what is New York City starting to do? All electrical controls are now being placed 10 feet above expected high water and at a huge cost. Aging infrastructure, you're all familiar with that. I, uh, I'm not going to dwell on that. I, we're going to come back to it as we go through. But I'd like to say that certainly deferred maintenance is one of the major issues. Now, Uncontrolled events, uh, natural disasters, they're occurring all the time. They've always occurred, but we didn't have people everywhere. And so we now have to start thinking about them. Impact of climate change, and I'll get to that. Now here's the typical thing that happens in New York City. They do a wonderful job of treatment, and then for a week, everything is discharged directly into the waters of the bay. And this is going on continually. And each time it happens, all the switch gear that was located in the basement of these facilities has to be replaced. And they've continued to replace it, but now they're starting to move it all up. And that's the new design that you'll see everywhere along the coastal regions, Vancouver, et cetera. Now, the next thing that's happened is that with climate change, areas that are dry are getting drier. Areas that are wet are getting wetter, but there's a more interesting phenomenon, and that is the intensity of the rainfall events. When I was a graduate student long ago, if we wanted to study a high-intensity rainfall event, we had to get data from India. Now we can get data from Arkansas, we can get data from Colorado, we can get data everywhere. Now, what does this mean? Here's a typical hydrograph of an inflow to a wastewater treatment plant. 
Under normal circumstances, this is kind of the diurnal variation, at this particular plant, it goes from about 7 MGD to 36 MGD in 30 minutes. There is no treatment plant that's designed to deal with that. Essentially what happens is the secondary clarifiers end up looking like this, with discharge out. And so all of a sudden we're faced with how do we deal with these extreme events? And on the one hand we have wetter events, on the other hand we have drier events. Now, City of San Francisco uh, has an enviable system. What they've done is they've built huge stormwater storage basins. And basically they go all around the periphery of the city. Essentially they trap, with the exception of perhaps one or two storm events, they trap all of the stormwater. Now, what they did is they built this discharge point to a channel here and they said, well, you know, there may be a storm of such magnitude that we ought to have a weir to allow it to discharge over into the slough. Here's the particular slough that we're talking about right here. Discharge is right about there. Let's take a look at what's actually happening. What's actually happening is, starting with the historical that was down here, we now have all of these events and flows now go back into these storage basins. Now what happens is that you bring seawater in, it's got a high sulfate content. There are all the restaurants are located along the periphery with hot grease. Hydrogen sulfide production is astonishing. If you walk along the Embarcadero, you'll see green standpipes. And all of these green standpipes are venting hydrogen sulfide. The rate of corrosion is truly amazing. So what are they having to do now? They're having to seal off all these weirs and put in pumping stations. So again, an unintended consequence. Another thing that really is affecting our field is the reduction in flow. Flows are decreasing across the country, and it's significant. Now the way to think about that, I'll just use one example. Up to about 1990, 92, the discharge per person was relatively constant. I'm not saying it was constant in each city, but it was relatively constant in, in a location. About 1992, conservation measures started to come in, and the flow has dropped continually since then. Now, what's interesting is we don't know where the second endpoint is going to be. And the reason we don't know that is we don't know how many 40 washing machines are out there with 40-gallon tubs. There are a lot of them still out there working. Someday, you won't be able to buy a 40-gallon tub. Now it's down to 20, and I predict within 10 years it'll be down to 5. And I estimate that this lower number down here will be about 37 gallons per capita per day. So all of a sudden, instead of projecting these great increases in flow, we have decreases in flow. Now, with conservation, Here's the question I would pose to you. What would make anyone believe that you could reduce the flow in wastewater collection systems by 60% and still have them function properly? And the answer is they don't. If you check the deposition velocities, we get, we're finding now deposition across the country. Now what's the problem? The problem is that you get hydrogen sulfide generated locally. The local issue is not much of a problem because there's enough atmosphere. But with the moving water, hydrogen sulfide is transported down to where you have reinforced concrete pipe. And again, the rates of corrosion are really rather amazing across the country. And you're going to continue to see this. And in areas where the, that are getting drier, exfiltration is becoming a factor. And with exfiltration, you have even less flow. So all of a sudden, we have to think about this infrastructure, this huge infrastructure that we have, and how we're going to manage it. Um, with older treatment plants, uh, there was very little concern for either the use of resources, energy consumption, sustainability, carbon footprint. We didn't even know those words existed. At three cents per kilowatt hour, it didn't matter much what you did. It really didn't. In biological treatment, if we look at energy consumption, clearly aeration is the uh, giant 
uh, in the room, 55% of the total amount used for wastewater treatment. So now all of these are issues that are going to affect our future designs. And we talked about decrease in flows. Here's Hyperion. These tanks are empty. These tanks are empty. Why? Because the flow has gone down by 60 to 80 million gallons per day, even though population has increased. Across the country, my estimate is that there's 30% excess tankage capacity. Now, that's not uniformly distributed, but across the country, there's about 30% empty tankage. And we're going to find other things to do with that. Now, after all that sort of doom and gloom, we ought to think about the future. So if you look at this list, we'll be here until about five. But <laughs> no, problem. no problem. So what I'd like to do is hit all of these topics a little bit just to give you a perspective of where I think we're going to be. Now, on this next one, I'm going to ask a favor. I'm going to ask that we all read this slide together, if you wouldn't mind. Just humor me. Come on. Wastewater is a renewable, recoverable source of potable water, resources, and energy. And that's the paradigm for the 21st century. Now, when I've given this talk in the past, I used to have energy as the second item. But it works out with the amount of fracking that's going on. Energy, the role of energy has to be rethought. I know that everyone thinks about energy, but it has to be rethought, especially with respect to what we do with carbon how we use carbon, and we'll get to that. Now, on resources, it's interesting if you think about the cellulose fiber that's in wastewater. Huge amounts of cellulose fiber. Uh, nutrients. Certainly, PHA, alginate, I think, represents a future uh, for many treatment plants. If we talk about alternative collection systems, pipe within a pipe, we're already doing this in some locations, and it's, there's also talk about doing a duel with urine separation and black water. And you could put these easily within an existing pipe using the existing structure, the existing pipe as the structure for the new system. Energy recovery, let's take a look at that. If we look at the energy content of wastewater, there are three sources. Uh, there's heat energy and uh, chemical energy and positional energy. I won't deal with positional energy. Specific heat is essentially that for water. If we look at chemical energy, if we use this formula for wastewater, we can compute the uh, chemical oxygen demand. Then a gentleman named Chanawala in 1992 looked at about 200 different organic compounds and developed a modified formula, uh, a modified do long formula, and this is the formula that uh, is given here below. This is the higher heating value based on elemental analysis. So if you follow that through, you'll find that wastewater typically has about 12 to 15 megajoules per kilogram of COD. So what does that mean? If we have uh, a typical treatment plant will vary from 1,200 to 2,400 megajoules per thousand cubic meters. If we assume we have a COD of 500 grams per meter, using that conversion factor, we find that we have about 6,000 megajoules per thousand cubic meters. So the energy available is at least two to four times that needed for treatment. Now, the challenge to all of you is, how are we going to recover that? You know, we have a lot of ideas, but a lot of new ideas are coming to the fore. And so the question is, how do we go about recovering that energy? Uh, certainly, we can use uh, heat pumps, and that's a fairly common use, and it's certainly increasing. Now, we can do it both from the collection system and or at the treatment plant. It just depends. In Germany, they do it in the collection system. Uh, in some of the recent designs here in the United States, it's at the treatment plant. Next issue is what do we do with food waste? Now, when you think about food waste, here's the issue. The, originally, food waste was encouraged, it was encouraged to grind it up and put it in the collection system. 
Then we started with conservation, and we said, no, that overloaded treatment facilities. But look what happens. When you put food waste in with, let's say, green waste for composting, and you go to a compost operation, it almost all goes up as methane. Why? Because the compost piles are not turned every day like you read in the textbook. And so as a consequence, it all is released. You go to a landfill, it's all released. So if we're worried about carbon footprint, it might make far more sense to either haul it directly and insert it into a digester, as they do in Oakland, San Francisco, many other cities. Or, alternatively, we could use the collection system. And so there's no right answer here. I'm just suggesting to you that food waste is a huge source of energy that we ought to tap into. Now, if we look at the fate of chemical energy during treatment, wastewater treatment, it looks something like this. But the question here that is fundamental to all of this is, what's the best use of the carbon? Is the best use of the carbon to produce methane? Or is the best use of the carbon to denitrify, uh, to remove phosphorus? And the answer to that question will be different in every part of the country. But it's not, uh, the way we're moving, everyone says that we ought to use the carbon for energy. But that may not be the right answer. Also, carbon may best be used for product formation. So this whole issue of energy has to be rethought in terms of resources, because ultimately the key thing is we're going to produce potable water. Enhanced uh, preliminary, preliminary treatment, grit and grease removal. Now, you would think that after 100 years of designing treatment plants, we could figure out grease. By and large, it, it's only been within the last 10 years that we've really gotten a handle on Greece. The way, and I must admit, even on some of my textbooks, I am guilty. What did we say? We said grit, how many remember grit had a specific gravity of 2.65? Go on, don't be bashful. Okay, I did too. Answer, wrong. Grit has a specific gravity of 1.3. Now, here's what happens. You go to treatment plants, and they've got a digester down, and you ask them, Why, what are you doing? And they typically will say, we're mucking out the sand. Why would you be doing that if your grit removal facilities were designed properly? The answer is they aren't. Here's what happens. You get surface active agents, and when they coat grit particles, instead of having this kind of a settling velocity pattern, they all have this kind of a settling velocity pattern. So if you look at a lot of grit removal facilities, for example, there are some where the grit has to settle down to the bottom and then removed along the floor. That's OK if the specific gravity is 2.65. But if it's 1.3, it's up here. That's why the, so many of these grit facilities don't work. One uh, application that has proven successful is the tray separator. And the tray separator, the white water flows in is distributed amongst all these trays. Now, what's the key here? The key here is that the grit only has to fall about two inches before it hits the surface and is removed. So it's really quite different. And this is based on a design of, uh, with grit of about 1.35. But again, it's stopping, stepping back and thinking about these things. We put these things in forever without ever thinking about them. Now, what I think we need to do next in, in, is we need to think about both alternative and enhanced primary treatment. And the reason for this is we want to develop disruptive technologies. What I mean by a disruptive technology is I don't want to take an existing technology and tinker with it. I want to just jump over it. Now, let me give you the example. Disk drives. Everyone had disk drives. Solid state memory just leaped right over all that. And we have to think about the same thing as we think about treatment. Now, here's an alternative. Uh, this is a typical uh, cloth screen filter. And this size is about a 1 MGD. And what's interesting is if you look at this, 
you really see basically fiber coming off because it just removes all of the fiber. Here's the performance. And we can use this as a complete replacement for primary sedimentation. And it does other things that are interesting. By having a very fine mesh, you remove all those bits of plastic that degrade uh, wastewater uh, sludge when we produce uh, biomass. And you want to compost it. You remove all that particulate matter. And now, but not only that, you can recover fiber at this point. That's one alternative. And uh, you can vary the mesh size depending on the characteristics of your collection system and what's happening. That's one idea. The next one is a very different idea. It's called charged bubble flotation. And it's very different than dissolved air flotation in that you produce a froth and you coat the froth with a polymer to which you can also add nanoparticles for the removal of specific constituents. And it works out that the area for this kind of a unit is about one-fifth the area that you need for conventional uh, dissolved air flotation. And just to give you an idea, this uh, little test unit here on the trailer is going to replace this whole unit. And instead of having the unit outdoors, they're, they're going to put it right within the building. And so, again, it's a different way of thinking about it. Now, all of a sudden, what we can do is, if there are specific compounds in the wastewater that we want to remove, we could target the nanoparticles for them. We can think differently. And what is all this leading to? All this is leading to the following concept. Why do we accept wastewater the way it comes? Why do we accept it the way it comes? Why not alter the particle size distribution to enhance biological treatment? Now, how do we do that? Well, we do that with primary effluent filtration. Here is a current setup that we're studying uh, with five different uh, filters. And we're, what we're doing is we're filtering primary here. You end up with a, essentially a soluble BOD here of about 60 to 80, depending on the treatment plant. Here is a stainless steel disc filter, cloth filter, and we're also looking at uh, two different compressible media filters. So a variety. And the interesting thing is whenever you hear this or whenever you mention primary effluent filtration, everyone says you'll never be able to backwash the filter. And that's simply not true. And the reason it's not true is that the organic matter in primary is not well organized. What I mean, if you're filtering cell tissue with extracellular polymers, there's a very big difference than filtering bread particles. And so it works out that we can filter. Now, what's exciting about this, we can take the filtrate from this, solubilize it, and produce volatile fatty acids. So there are a variety of alternatives that we now have available to us. We'll also talk about some different treatment plant designs. Here's what happens, in other words, if you have plant upsets, if you have a filtration system online, essentially it comes in like this, and this is what happens with uh, plant upset. Now, the next thing that we really need to consider, and that is flow equalization. Flow equalization buys you so much in terms of treatment performance, you cannot imagine. And what's interesting now is that with all this excess capacity that we have at treatment plants, we have the opportunity to implement flow equalization. And we're going to talk about flow equalization of the incoming flow, and we want to talk especially about flow equalization of all return flows. We don't want to return those flows during peak daytime hours, which is common practice throughout the United States. Now, interestingly enough, we can flow equalize and get a horizontal line. The, what's a bit more challenging is to do load equalization. And we know how to do that now with the TOC uh, measurement techniques that we have. We can do load equalization. And that represents really the future where you don't have peaking demand for energy during the day. You've equalized your load. And that changes the whole dynamics of treatment. And we know how to do that now. Uh, alternative treatment technologies. Now, here, remember we were talking about primary effluent filtration. 
Well, it works out that with primary effluent filtration, you can essentially go into a denitrification step, but you nitrify, bring back the flow, and there's barely enough carbon left to denitrify, so you never have to treat the carbonaceous demand. That's huge. Remember that spike we had, 55%? By this process, you never have, if there's any excess carbon, it's obviously converted in the first portion of this reactor, but by recycling, we essentially uh, don't really have to deal with the carbonaceous demand, and that is huge. An alternative is, uh, and I know there are a number of people in the audience that study biological systems, and so I'll ask for their forgiveness, but uh, here we could go to filtration, microfiltration, and reverse osmosis directly without biological treatment. And that project, that uh, process is being studied at the present time. Uh, obviously, there are some exciting biological processes. The aminox is certainly one in which instead of going to nitritation, you go to nitritation, and then the animox reaction takes the nitrite with ammonium and converts it to nitrogen gas. And what are the advantages? 40% less oxygen use, 11% less carbon. Now, it's been applied primarily to high strength, uh, let's say, return flows, but there's uh, any number of uh, researchers are working on ambient <coughs> animox treatment. And I think within five years, you, you will see this as a technology uh, for use. Uh, it depends on sequencing, and there are a lot of other factors, but look, the animox bacteria were always there, but they weren't identified until about 12 years ago, 12, 15 years ago. How about membrane without biological treatment? So we go to a disc filter here, we go to uh, a fuzzy filter here, and we go directly to a membrane here. Now what's interesting, if you do this, if there's some soluble BOD left over, you can run it over a tower trickling filter, <coughs> produce secondary effluent without the need for sedimentation. So all of a sudden, I think we can make trickling filters work much better than they have in the past. Because, a couple of things. Number one, we now control the particle size, and you essentially are treating soluble waste. A very, very big difference. Again, these are huge differences that we can think about in terms of how we design biological processes. Well, we can also take it to the extreme, and here's the complete uh, waste-activated sludge with adsorption. We take the adsorbed material, we uh, dry it, char it, and use it, continue the recycle. Uh, we go through ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, and a complete process without biological treatment. And certainly, a lot of people are looking at this as a possibility also. Now, we talked a little about return flows, but what happens? The conventional diagram you see is that all of these return flows are brought back to the headworks. So you go out to treatment plants and you, you talk to the operators and you say, all right, when do you return your flows back? Well, they said, well, you know, the operators are here during the daytime hours, so they come back during the daytime hours. You return them during the daytime hours when you have peak loading, organic loading, and then you wonder why the treatment plant doesn't work. As a minimum, as a minimum, those, all those flows should be captured and brought into the treatment plant from about 8 to 6 in the morning. Because you've got excess aeration capacity. And if you couple that with load equalization, that changes it even more dramatically. Uh, phosphorus recovery, you're all familiar with, I won't deal with that. You couldn't have one of these talks without urine separation. You know that. So, what I want to show you first is a great engineering feat. Do you notice this fly here? Not to be indelicate, but men have a tendency to want to pee it off. <laughs> but the secret is, it's cast into the porcelain. With that little device, capture has gone up from 80% to 95%. <laughs> I mean, 
finished. It's, it's an engineering wonderment when you think <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> now, let's, let's take a look at urine. It's, it's really interesting, because if you look at nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, they're essentially all in urine. If you were to look at the volume, feces in urine, it's this, and here's gray water. If you were to land on Earth today, you would say, yeah, that's a strange system for this volume of water. More importantly, it's now estimated that about anywhere up to 90% of the trace organics and certainly the medicines are in urine. Now, one of the issues with medicine, when you take medicine, the dose is much higher than you need because you need a driving force to get the active agent into the cell wall. And so the excess goes off in urine. Now, everyone talks immediately about urine separation. And so let's take a look. Uh, if we had urine separation, this is what it would be. After primary, it would be this. And if, this, uh, if you look at cell yield requirements, it works out there's not enough nitrogen and or phosphorus if you remove all the urine. So all of a sudden now, what seemed like a wonderful idea, you remove it, and then you have to put it back in. So it's not as simple as it seems. So it, it just depends on what your objective is. Now, any Norwegians in the audience? Well, I had a graduate student. I sent him off to Norway. And uh, he, he came back, and, he's, and I said, well, what'd you think? He said, well, you know, Norwegians are poop hobbyists. I said, what's that mean? Well, he said, you know, they like to think about it, examine it, uh, debate about it. We in America just like it to flush and go away. So in this house, you notice this nice atrium here? If you go into the house, if you go to the bathroom in this house, urine goes directly to the constructed wetland within the house. I don't see much enthusiasm for this idea. <laughs> Here, I'm giving you all these good ideas and not much enthusiasm, but well. Now, uh, we've also looked at nutrient storage from, uh, and recovery from individual residences. The key to this thing is you have to use a bladder so that there's no headspace because it'll volatilize. And so you want to use an expandable bladder and you could pump it once a year and it would work. Now, the next a uh, big thing that's going to happen, I think, is direct and indirect potable reuse. And um, if we look at indirect potable reuse, we take water from the community, we treat it, and then we put it into a storage reservoir or into the groundwater, and that would be the, uh, into the groundwater would be Orange County, into a reservoir or river would be the Mississippi, every river in the country. What we're now talking about doing is taking this water through an engineered storage buffer and then reintroducing it either at the head end of a treatment facility or directly into the distribution system. But now there's a very peculiar thing that's happened with uh, the way we've designed historically our water systems. Everyone says, well, what about desal? Well, no, desal is not a bad idea. But if you start with TDS of 35,000 milligrams per liter, and you go through a single pass, you end up with 350. But the 350 is all sodium chloride. The water tastes terrible. So now what do you have to do? In Southern California, they're going to build a 22-mile pipeline to take water back up to find some place to dilute it. The pipeline costs two times what the treatment facility does. Now, look at the way we built our treatment, our water distribution systems. We built all the storage reservoirs up high in the mountains so if we could fight fires. The, up there, the pipelines are this big around. When you get down to the coast, relatively speaking, there's this big around. There's no dilution water. And so all of a sudden, there's a real problem here. Now, people will talk about Eshkelon in Israel. And there, they do three stages of reverse osmosis. But the third stage is primarily for the removal of boron. Because boron, 
affects plants dramatically, and the water is used primarily. For drinking water, they basically reconstitute the water. Reconstitute the water. And if you buy some um, uh, bottled water that uh, is uh, vapor uh, distilled, it'll say on the bottle, reconstituted for taste. But incidentally, let's talk a little about bottled water. When you buy bottled water, and you, you pick up the thing, and it says purified. Did you ever ask if it was wastewater yesterday? Did it occur to you? It might have been. But as long as it says purified, you're good to go. So, the future really lies in direct potable reuse. Orange County uh, has demonstrated this reliably. I'd like to just give you the example of San Diego. Orange County got, gets water from the sanitary district right next door. And the plant there did not nitrify. So it started nitrifying. Performance went up by 30%. All right, so that was interesting. So uh, San Diego wants to do direct potable reuse. So they built exactly the same pilot plant, uh, same system that Orange County has. They put it into operation. And lo and behold, they don't find a single problem. And you look at that and you say, why is that? Well, the answer is, it's a scalping plant, so it operates at constant flow. And two, all of the return flows are sent to Point Loma. They never come back to the plant. And when you do that, it changes the treatment performance dramatically. Dramatically when you do that. And so this you know, leads us to the notion that not every activated sludge plant is suitable for direct potable reuse. Um, now, I believe that direct potable reuse uh, offers an opportunity for uh, the activated sludge process to be redefined, totally redefined. And what I'd like to talk to you about is alternative endpoints for biological treatment process design. So if I were to ask you, what's the endpoint of biological treatment? I think most people would say discharge to the environment. OK? But what if I told you that, no, the endpoint of activated sludge is to produce a biologically treated liquid that we can filter with microfiltration and reverse osmosis. And that becomes the activated sludge process. Not just secondary sedimentation, but the whole process. Now, what that does is it changes your thinking. It changes your thinking from focusing, let's say, on nitrogen and phosphorus and other things, to what would be optimal for membrane treatment. Now, for example, we do a lot of work on membrane fouling. Everyone wants to do membrane fouling. Why not produce a biological material that's porous? Why not alter the characteristics of the mixed liquor so that it's porous? Now, a step in this direction certainly is granular activated carbon. And that's going to change really the dynamics of membrane technology. Because you know, you've got these granules now, and they're porous, 30% porosity. And they're produced, uh, you know, you get them in anaerobic treatment all the time, but now granular activated sludge. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that the future lies not in tinkering with this process to get it a little bit better for wastewater treatment, but thinking about it in terms of these other processes and how to optimize for those processes. And really, you really want to operate for treatment results, not settleability. You want to decide what it is that you want and then modify the activated sludge process to produce that kind of an effluent. Now, another uh, element of the uh, water, wastewater management structure is going to be integrated wastewater management. And here, what we're looking at is a combination of satellite treatment, uh, centralized treatment, reuse opportunities, direct potable, in 
The, the concept here is that all of these kinds of technologies make sense. And um, when we talk about satellite systems for reclamation and reuse, there are four types, but I want to deal with two. The first one is known as the interception type. And here you have a building, and you flush, but you intercept all of the wastewater before it ever goes into the collection system. In other words, it does not go into the collection system. You intercept it, treat it, and reuse it. The second type is the extraction type, where you extract wastewater from a collection system, use it locally, discharge all the solids back to the system. So let's take a look at two examples. This is the Solaire building in New York City, and now there are many more. But basically, all the water is trapped. It's brought down into a membrane bioreactor. And you'll notice they use ozone and UV. Now, it's interesting. With a membrane bioreactor, if you've operated them, you'll know that uh, the effluent has a slight yellow color, which is characteristic of indole, a component of urine. It's a slightly yellow color. And so the ozone, basically, is used to decolor the uh, treated effluent. And it works well. And this building's in operation. These are very expensive apartments. And you're certainly going to see more of this go on. Now, this system in Southern California has been in operation for about 25 years. And when you talk to people, you, you ask them, well, what about this house on the end? What, uh, that's dead. Look, the house in the circle. And they'll say, well, you know, well, well, those folks are a bit wealthier than we are because it's a great big house. Actually, it's the wastewater treatment plant. It's an, extra it's an extraction wastewater treatment plant. It looks, no one in that na whole neighborhood ever knew anything about it. It looks just like every other house. What's the point of that? The point of that is when we build systems in satellite locations, they should not look like industrial facilities. They should look like the buildings that are surrounding that area. So if we um, just review for a moment, there's energy and nutrients, uh, and I would put products in wastewater underutilized. There are new models for retrofitting systems. Clearly, new technologies are going to revolutionize the design of, active, of wastewater treatment plants. Potable reuse is here to stay. It's going to become a larger factor. There are at least six to eight systems in Texas now that, have been, uh, that are working on it. Three or four have been permitted. Um, but as we think about meeting all of these challenges, we're also going to have to think about the regulatory challenges. And here, uh, it's science versus regulations. And pre-1880s, physical observations. You know, uh, if you read the old textbooks, not one I wrote, but the old textbooks, they would take a, a sample of water and they would put it on the shelf. And if it developed growths, it probably wasn't good to drink. But you were dead, but, so it didn't matter much. Uh, the Enlightenment period was from 1880 to about 1980. Uh, science developed, and we had semi-empirical and observational regulations. For example, the Title 22 regulations for water reuse in California date back to 1968. We didn't have a single plant in California that nitrified. So all of the chlorine discharge requirements are based on chloramination. Trying to get those changed is just monumental. You come in with a membrane bioreactor and the state says, well, you still need a CT of 450. That is con residual concentration of chlorine times time of 450. Well, that negates using a membrane bioreactor. You haven't got that kind of space. We're working on it, but it's slow. Post-1980s, science I just has leapt ahead so dramatically, so dramatically. And yet, we still have semi-empirical regulations. And all of us, you especially, I've had a full career, but you folks especially, are going to have to work with regulators. And if you're regulators, you're going to have to broaden your perspective. 
to start to encompass some of these new technologies because some of these old regulations are really holding us back in terms of the kinds of technologies that we have. Now, you thought that was the end, right? Now, chaos theory. Lute is up here, she's published on this, but let me give you my version of chaos theory. When we wanted to remove substances down to, let's say, phosphorus, down to two or three milligrams per liter, it was all very easy. But now we're talking about getting way, way down, much lower. Now, when you get down much lower, interesting thing happens. Uh, would any of us believe that wastewater is the same day in, day out? No. All right, so now let's talk about very low concentrations. If you started at this point, and you would end up somewhere on the space. It's typically drawn as a three-dimensional thing. I've just used two dimensions for illustrative purposes. When the concentrations were way up here, up, you know, two or three milligrams per liter, it didn't matter. You always met it. But as you get down lower and lower, what's going to happen is, day one you start with a certain concentration and you end up at some point. Now, if I told you we're going to start with a different concentration, would you believe that you're going to end up at the same point? No, I don't think any of us would believe that. You'd say, well, you know, it'll be somewhat different. Ah, if you started the next day, it would so still be somewhat different. And the answer is that when we get down to these very, very low discharge limits, it may not be possible to do it with a single treatment process. In other words, you may have to have two processes. And the reason is that you can't get away from chaos theory. And it's important for all of you to think about it because what we're saying is each day you start with something and you're going to end up somewhere. The next day, the wastewater has changed, as we all know, and you end up somewhere else. And it's a, just an interesting way to think about that. In closing, uh, in the um, 20th century, basically regulations drove wastewater treatment. And by that, what I meant is that we had incrementalism. We started off with primary sedimentation, and then we added activated sludge, and then we actually added clarifiers, and then we added filters. And we kept waiting, we, you, kept waiting until the regulators told us what they wanted to remove next and we said, yeah, we can do that. In the 21st century, it's going to be the value of potable water, resources, and energy are going to drive the designs. And you, the engineering community, are going to lead the way by developing new processes that do it even better. And I'd like to give you one, just uh, another example, just to show you what, what this pencils out like. Our governor in California wants to build twin tunnels around the Bay Delta to transport water to Los Angeles. And the estimated cost is $30 billion. It works out that I can take all of the waste from Southern California, treat it with two stages of reverse osmosis, if anyone is uh, concerned, for $6 billion. That's what the economics pencil out like. And they're going to pencil out even better when, you know, when all the things you folks are working on, you start to apply. And I think there's nothing but really uh, an excitement about our field now that hasn't, you know, we're rethinking all of these things. And I think that that's the challenge of the 21st century. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening.